Book One, Chapter One of The Beautiful and Damned by F. Scott Fitzgerald. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mark Nelson. Book One, Chapter One Anthony Patch. In 1913, when Anthony Patch was twenty-five, two years were already gone since Irony, the Holy Ghost of this latter day, had, theoretically at least, descended upon him. Irony was the final polish of the shoe, the ultimate dab of the clothes-brush, a sort of intellectual there. Yet at the brink of this story he has as yet gone no further than the conscious stage. As you first see him, he wonders frequently whether he is not without honor and slightly mad, a shameful and obscene thinness glistening on the surface of the world like oil on a clean pond, these occasions being varied, of course, with those in which he thinks himself rather an exceptional young man, thoroughly sophisticated, well adjusted to his environment, and somewhat more significant than any one else he knows. This was his healthy state, and it made him cheerful, pleasant, and very attractive to intelligent men and to all women. In this state he considered that he would one day accomplish some quiet subtle thing that the elect would deem worthy, and, passing on, would join the dinner stars in a nebulous, indeterminate heaven halfway between death and immortality. Until the time came for this effort he would be Anthony Patch not a portrait of a man, but a distinct and dynamic personality, opinionated, contemptuous, functioning from within outward. A man who was aware that there could be no honor, and yet had honor, who knew the sophistry of courage, and yet was brave. A Worthy Man and His Gifted Son Anthony drew as much consciousness of Social Security from being the grandson of Adam J. Patch as he would have had from tracing his line over the sea to the Crusaders. This is inevitable, Virginians and Bostonians to the contrary notwithstanding, an aristocracy founded sheerly on money postulates wealth in the particular. Now Adam J. Patch, more familiarly known as Cross Patch, left his father's farm in Terrytown early in sixty-one to join a New York cavalry regiment. He came home from the war a major, charged into Wall Street, and amid much fuss, fume, applause, and ill-will, he gathered to himself some seventy-five million dollars. This occupied his energies until he was fifty-seven years old. It was then that he determined, after a severe attack of sclerosis, to consecrate the remainder of his life to the moral regeneration of the world. He became a reformer among reformers. Emulating the magnificent efforts of Anthony Comstock, after whom his grandson was named, he leveled a varied assortment of uppercuts and body-blows at liquor, literature, vice, art, patent medicines, and Sunday theatres. His mind, under the influence of that insidious mildew which eventually forms on all but the few, gave itself up furiously to every indignation of the age. From an armchair in the office of his Terrytown estate, he directed against the enormous hypothetical enemy, Unrighteousness, a campaign which went on through fifteen years, during which he displayed himself a rabid monomaniac, an unqualified nuisance, and an intolerable bore. The year in which this story opens found him wearying. His campaign had grown desultory. 1861 was creeping up slowly on 1895. His thoughts ran a great deal on the Civil War, somewhat on his dead wife and son, almost infinitesimally on his grandson Anthony. Early in his career Adam Patch had married an anemic lady of thirty, Alicia Withers, who brought him one hundred thousand dollars and an impeccable entree into the banking circles of New York. Immediately, and rather spunkily, she had borne him a son, and, as if completely devitalized by the magnificence of this performance, she had thenceforth effaced herself within the shadowy dimensions of the nursery. 
the boy, Adam Ulysses Patch, became an inveterate joiner of clubs, connoisseur of good form, and driver of tandems. At the astonishing age of twenty-six he began his memoirs under the title New York Society as I Have Seen It. On the rumor of its conception this work was eagerly bid for among publishers, but as it proved after his death to be immoderately verbose and overpoweringly dull, it never obtained even a private printing. This Fifth Avenue Chesterfield married at twenty-two. His wife was Henrietta Lebrun, the Boston Society Contralto, and the single child of the Union was, at the request of his grandfather, christened Anthony Comstock Patch. When he went to Harvard, the Comstock dropped out of his name to a nether hell of oblivion and was never heard of thereafter. Young Anthony had one picture of his father and mother together. So often had it faced his eyes in childhood, that it had acquired the impersonality of furniture, but every one who came into his bedroom regarded it with interest. It showed a dandy of the nineties, spare and handsome, standing beside a tall dark lady with a muff and the suggestion of a bustle. Between them was a little boy with long brown curls, dressed in a velvet Lord Fauntleroy suit. This was Anthony at five the year of his mother's death. His memories of the Boston Society Contralto were nebulous and musical. She was a lady who sang, sang, sang in the music-room of their house on Washington Square, sometimes with guests scattered all about her, the men with their arms folded, balanced breathlessly on the edges of sofas, the women with their hands in their laps, occasionally making little whispers to the men and always clapping very briskly and utterly cooing cries after each song, and often she sang to Anthony alone, in Italian or French or in a strange and terrible dialect which she imagined to be the speech of the southern negro. His recollections of the gallant Ulysses, the first man in America to roll the lapels of his coat, were much more vivid. After Henrietta Lebrun Patch had joined another choir, as her widower huskily remarked from time to time, father and son lived up at Grandpa's in Terrytown, and Ulysses came daily to Anthony's nursery and expelled pleasant, thick-smelling words for sometimes as much as an hour. He was continually promising Anthony hunting trips and fishing trips and excursions to Atlantic City, oh, sometime soon now but none of them ever materialized. One trip they did take. When Anthony was eleven they went abroad, to England and Switzerland, and there, in the best hotel in Lucerne, his father died with much sweating and grunting and crying aloud for air. In a panic of despair and terror Anthony was brought back to America, wedded to a vague melancholy that was to stay beside him through the rest of his life. Past and Person of the Hero At eleven he had a horror of death. Within six impressionable years his parents had died, and his grandmother had faded off almost imperceptibly, until, for the first time since her marriage, her person held for one day an unquestioned supremacy over her own drawing-room. So to Anthony life was a struggle against death, that waited at every corner. It was a concession to the hypochondriacal imagination that he formed a habit of reading in bed. It soothed him. He read until he was tired and often fell asleep with the light still on. His favorite diversion until he was fourteen was his stamp collection. Enormous, as nearly exhaustive as a boy's could be, his grandfather considered fatuously that it was teaching him geography. So Anthony kept up a correspondence with a half-dozen stamp and coin companies, and it was rare that the mail failed to bring him new stamp books or packages of glittering approval sheets. There was a mysterious fascination in transferring his acquisitions interminably from one book to another. His stamps were his greatest happiness, and he bestowed impatient frowns on anyone who interrupted him at play with them. They devoured his allowance every month and he lay awake at night musing untiringly on their variety and many-colored splendor. At sixteen he had lived almost entirely within himself, an inarticulate boy, 
thoroughly un-American and politely bewildered by his contemporaries. The two preceding years had been spent in Europe with a private tutor, who persuaded him that Harvard was the thing. It would open doors, it would be a tremendous tonic, it would give him innumerable self-sacrificing and devoted friends. So he went to Harvard. There was no other logical thing to be done with him. Oblivious to the social system, he lived for a while alone and unsought in a high room in Beck Hall, a slim, dark boy of medium height with a shy, sensitive mouth. His allowance was more than liberal. He laid the foundations for a library by purchasing from a wandering bibliophile first editions of Swinburne, Meredith, and Hardy, and a yellowed, illegible autograph letter of Keats's, finding later that he had been amazingly overcharged. He became an exquisite dandy, amassed a rather pathetic collection of silk pajamas, brocaded dressing gowns, and neckties too flamboyant to wear. In this secret finery he would parade before a mirror in his room, or lie stretched in satin along his window-seat, looking down on the yard and realizing dimly this clamor, breathless and immediate, in which it seemed he was never to have a part. Curiously enough, he found in senior year that he had acquired a position in his class. He learned that he was looked upon as a rather romantic figure, a scholar, a recluse, a tower of erudition. This amused him, but secretly pleased him. He began going out, at first a little and then a great deal. He made the pudding. He drank, quietly and in the proper tradition. It was said of him that, had he not come to college so young, he might have done extremely well. In 1909, when he graduated, he was only twenty years old. Then abroad again, to Rome this time, where he dallied with architecture and painting in turn, took up the violin, and wrote some ghastly Italian sonnets, supposedly the ruminations of a thirteenth-century monk on the joys of the contemplative life. It became established among his Harvard intimates that he was in Rome, and those of them who were abroad that year looked him up and discovered with him, on many moonlight excursions, much in the city that was older than the Renaissance, or indeed, than the Republic. Mari Noble, from Philadelphia, for instance, remained two months, and together they realized the peculiar charm of Latin women and had a delightful sense of being very young and free in a civilization that was very old and free. Not a few acquaintances of his grandfather's called on him, and had he so desired, he might have been persona grata with the diplomatic set. Indeed, he found that his inclinations tended more and more toward conviviality, but that long adolescent aloofness and consequent shyness still dictated to his conduct. He returned to America in 1912 because of one of his grandfather's sudden illnesses, and, after an excessively tiresome talk with the perpetually convalescent old man, he decided to put off until his grandfather's death the idea of living permanently abroad. After a prolonged search he took an apartment on 52nd Street, and to all appearances settled down. In 1913 Anthony Patch's adjustment of himself to the universe was in process of consummation. Physically he had improved since his undergraduate days. He was still too thin, but his shoulders had widened, and his brunette face had lost the frightened look of his freshman year. He was secretly orderly, and in person spick and span. His friends declared that they had never seen his hair rumpled. His nose was too sharp, his mouth was one of those unfortunate mirrors of mood inclined to droop perceptibly in moments of unhappiness. But his blue eyes were charming, whether alert with intelligence or half-closed in an expression of melancholy humor. One of those men devoid of the symmetry of feature essential to the Aryan ideal, he was yet, here and there, considered handsome. Moreover, he was very clean, in appearance and in reality, with that especial cleanness borrowed from beauty. THE REPROACHLESS APARTMENT Fifth and Sixth Avenues, it seemed to Anthony, 
were the uprights of a gigantic ladder stretching from Washington Square to Central Park. Coming uptown on top of a bus toward 52nd Street invariably gave him the sensation of hoisting himself hand by hand on a series of treacherous rungs, and when the bus jolted to a stop at his own rung he found something akin to relief as he descended the reckless metal steps to the sidewalk. After that he had but to walk down 52nd Street half a block, pass a stodgy family of brownstone houses, and then in a jiffy he was under the high ceilings of his great front room. This was entirely satisfactory. Here, after all, life began. Here he slept, breakfasted, read, and entertained. The house itself was of murky material, built in the late nineties. In response to the steadily growing need of small apartments, each floor had been thoroughly remodeled and rented individually. Of the four apartments, Anthony's on the second floor was the most desirable. The front room had fine high ceilings, and three large windows that loomed down pleasantly upon 52nd Street. In its appointments it escaped by a safe margin being of any particular period. It escaped stiffness, stuffiness, bareness, and decadence. It smelt neither of smoke nor of incense. It was tall and faintly blue. There was a deep lounge of the softest brown leather, with somnolence drifting about it like a haze. There was a high screen of Chinese lacquer, chiefly concerned with geometrical fishermen and huntsmen in black and gold. This made a corner alcove for a voluminous chair guarded by an orange-colored standing lamp. Deep in the fireplace a quartered shield was burned to a murky black. Passing through the dining-room, which, as Anthony took only breakfast at home, was merely a magnificent potentiality, and down a comparatively long hall, one came to the heart and core of the apartment, Anthony's bedroom and bath. Both of them were immense. Under the ceilings of the former even the great canopied bed seemed of only average size. On the floor an exotic rug of crimson velvet was soft as fleece on his bare feet. His bathroom, in contrast to the rather portentous character of his bedroom, was gay, bright, extremely habitable, and even faintly facetious. Framed around the walls were photographs of four celebrated thespian beauties of the day, Julia Sanderson as the Sunshine Girl, Ina Clare as the Quaker Girl, Billy Burke as the Mind the Paint Girl, and Hazel Dawn as the Pink Lady. Between Billy Burke and Hazel Dawn hung a print representing a great stretch of snow presided over by a cold and formidable sun. This, claimed Anthony, symbolized the cold shower. The bathtub, equipped with an ingenious bookholder, was low and large. Beside it a wall wardrobe bulged with sufficient linen for three men, and with a generation of neckties. There was no skimpy, glorified towel of a carpet. Instead, a rich rug, like the one in his bedroom a miracle of softness, that seemed almost to massage the wet foot emerging from the tub. All in all, a room to conjure with. It was easy to see that Anthony dressed there, arranged his immaculate hair there, in fact did everything but sleep and eat there. It was his pride, this bathroom. He felt that if he had a love he would have hung her picture just facing the tub, so that, lost in the soothing steamings of the hot water, he might lie and look up at her and muse warmly and sensuously on her beauty. Nor does he spin. The apartment was kept clean by an English servant, with this singularly, almost theatrically, appropriate name of Bounds, whose technique was marred only by the fact that he wore a soft collar. Had he been entirely Anthony's Bounds, this defect would have been summarily remedied, but he was also the Bounds of two other gentlemen in the neighborhood. From eight until eleven in the morning he was entirely Anthony's. He arrived with the mail and cooked breakfast. At nine-thirty he pulled the edge of Anthony's blanket and spoke a few terse words. Anthony never remembered clearly what they were, and rather suspected they were deprecative. Then he served breakfast on a card-table in the front room, made the bed, and, after asking with some hostility if there was anything else, withdrew. 
In the mornings, at least once a week, Anthony went to see his broker. His income was slightly under seven thousand a year, the interest on money inherited from his mother. His grandfather, who had never allowed his own son to graduate from a very liberal allowance, judged that this sum was sufficient for young Anthony's needs. Every Christmas he sent him a five-hundred-dollar bond, which Anthony usually sold, if possible, as he was always a little, not very, hard up. The visits to his broker varied from semi-social chats to discussions of the safety of eight percent investments, and Anthony always enjoyed them. The big trust company building seemed to link him definitely to the great fortunes whose solidarity he respected, and to assure him that he was adequately chaperoned by the hierarchy of finance. From these hurried men he derived the same sense of safety that he had in contemplating his grandfather's money. Even more, for the latter appeared, vaguely, a demand loan made by the world to Adam Patch's own moral righteousness, while this money downtown seemed rather to have been grasped and held by sheer indomitable strengths and tremendous feats of will. In addition, it seemed more definitely and explicitly money. Closely as Anthony trod on the heels of his income, he considered it to be enough. Some golden day, of course, he would have many millions. Meanwhile, he possessed a raison d'etre in the theoretical creation of essays on the popes of the Renaissance. This flashes back to the conversation with his grandfather immediately upon his return from Rome. He had hoped to find his grandfather dead, but had learned by telephoning from the pier that Adam Patch was comparatively well again. The next day he had concealed his disappointment and gone out to Terrytown. Five miles from the station his taxicab entered an elaborately groomed drive that threaded a veritable maze of walls and wire fences guarding the estate. This, said the public, was because it was definitely known that if the socialists had their way, one of the first men they'd assassinate would be Old Cross Patch. Anthony was late, and the venerable philanthropist was awaiting him in a glass-walled sun-parlor, where he was glancing through the morning papers for the second time. His secretary, Edward Shuttleworth, who before his regeneration had been gambler, saloon-keeper, and general reprobate, ushered Anthony into the room, exhibiting his redeemer and benefactor as though he were displaying a treasure of immense value. They shook hands gravely. "'I'm awfully glad to hear you're better,' Anthony said. The senior Patch, with an air of having seen his grandson only last week, pulled out his watch. "'Train late?' he asked mildly. It had irritated him to wait for Anthony. He was under the delusion not only that in his youth he had handled his practical affairs with the utmost scrupulousness, even to keeping every engagement on the dot, but also that this was the direct and primary cause of his success. "'It's been late a good deal this month.' he remarked with a shade of meek accusation in his voice, and then, after a long sigh, "'Sit down.' Anthony surveyed his grandfather with that tacit amazement which always attended the sight. That this feeble, unintelligent old man was possessed of such power, that, yellow journals to the contrary, the men in the Republic whose souls he could not have bought directly or indirectly would scarcely have populated White Plains, seemed as impossible to believe as that he had once been a pink-and-white baby. The span of his seventy-five years had acted as a magic bellows. The first quarter-century had blown him full with life, and the last had sucked it all back. It had sucked in the cheeks and the chest and the girth of arm and leg. It had tyrannously demanded his teeth one by one, suspended his small eyes in dark, bluish sacks, tweaked out his hairs, changed him from gray to white in some places, from pink to yellow in others, callously transposing his colors like a child trying over a paint-box. Then through his body and his soul it had attacked his brain. It had sent him night-sweats and tears and unfounded dreads. It had split his intense normality into credulity and suspicion. 
out of the coarse material of his enthusiasm it had cut dozens of meek but petulant obsessions. His energy was shrunk to the bad temper of a spoiled child, and for his will to power was substituted a fatuous puerile desire for a land of harps and canticles on earth. The amenities having been gingerly touched upon, Anthony felt that he was expected to outline his intentions, and simultaneously a glimmer in the old man's eye warned him against broaching, for the present, his desire to live abroad. He wished that Shuttleworth would have tact enough to leave the room. He detested Shuttleworth, but the secretary had settled blandly in a rocker and was dividing between the two patches the glances of his faded eyes. "'Now that you are here and ought to do something,' said his grandfather softly, "'accomplish something.' Anthony waited for him to speak of leaving something done when you pass on, then he made a suggestion. I thought, it seemed to me, that perhaps I'm best qualified to write. Adam Patch winced, visualizing a family poet with a long hair and three mistresses. History, finished Anthony. History? History of what? The Civil War? The Revolution? Why, no, sir. A history of the Middle Ages. Simultaneously, an idea was born for a history of the Renaissance popes, written from some novel angle. Still, he was glad he had said Middle Ages. Middle Ages? Why not your own country? Something you know about? Well, you see, I've lived so much abroad. Why you should write about the Middle Ages, I don't know. Dark Ages, we used to call them. Nobody knows what happened, and nobody cares, except that they're over now." He continued for some minutes on the uselessness of such information, touching naturally on the Spanish Inquisition and the corruption of the monasteries. Then, "'Do you think you'll be able to do any work in New York, or do you really intend to work at all?' This last with soft, almost imperceptible cynicism. Why, yes, I do, sir. When'll you be done? Well, there'll be an outline, you see, and a lot of preliminary reading. I should think you'd have done enough of that already. The conversation worked itself jerkily toward a rather abrupt conclusion, when Anthony rose, looked at his watch, and remarked that he had an engagement with his broker that afternoon. He had intended to stay a few days with his grandfather, but he was tired and irritated from a rough crossing, and quite unwilling to stand a subtle and sanctimonious browbeating. He would come out again in a few days, he said. Nevertheless, it was due to this encounter that work had come into his life as a permanent idea. During the year that had passed since then, he had made several lists of authorities, and had even experimented with chapter titles and the division of his work into periods, but not one line of actual writing existed at present, or seemed likely ever to exist. He did nothing, and, contrary to the most accredited copy-book logic, he managed to divert himself with more than average content. Afternoon It was October in 1913 midway in a week of pleasant days, with the sunshine loitering in the cross-streets and the atmosphere so languid as to seem weighted with ghostly falling leaves. It was pleasant to sit lazily by the open window, finishing a chapter of Erewhon. It was pleasant to yawn about five, toss the book on a table, and saunter humming along the hall to his bath. To you, beautiful lady, he was singing as he turned on the tap. I raise my eyes to you, beautiful lady, my heart cries. He raised his voice to compete with the flood of water pouring into the tub, and as he looked at the picture of Hazel Dawn upon the wall, he put an imaginary violin to his shoulder and softly caressed it with a phantom bow. Through his closed lips he made a humming noise, which he vaguely imagined resembled the sound of a violin. 
After a moment his hands ceased their gyrations and wandered to his shirt, which he began to unfasten. Stripped, and adopting an athletic posture like the tiger-skin man in the advertisement, he regarded himself with some satisfaction in the mirror, breaking off to dabble a tentative foot in the tub. Readjusting a faucet and indulging in a few preliminary grunts, he slid in. Once accustomed to the temperature of the water, he relaxed into a state of drowsy content. When he finished his bath, he would dress leisurely and walk down Fifth Avenue to the Ritz, where he had an appointment for dinner with his two most frequent companions, Dick Caramel and Maury Noble. Afterward, he and Maury were going to the theater. Caramel would probably trot home and work on his book, which ought to be finished pretty soon. Anthony was glad he wasn't going to work on his book. The notion of sitting down and conjuring up, not only words in which to clothe thoughts, but thoughts worthy of being clothed, the whole thing was absurdly beyond his desires. Emerging from his bath, he polished himself with the meticulous attention of a bootblack. Then he wandered into the bedroom, and, whistling the while a weird, uncertain melody, strolled here and there buttoning, adjusting, and enjoying the warmth of the thick carpet on his feet. He lit a cigarette, tossed the match out the open top of the window, then paused in his tracks with the cigarette two inches from his mouth, which fell faintly ajar. His eyes were focused upon a spot of brilliant color on the roof of a house farther down the alley. It was a girl in a red negligee, silk surely, drying her hair by the still hot sun of late afternoon. His whistle died upon the stiff air of the room. He walked cautiously another step nearer the window with a sudden impression that she was beautiful. Sitting on the stone parapet beside her was a cushion the same color as her garment, and she was leaning both arms upon it as she looked down into the sunny areaway, where Anthony could hear children playing. He watched her for several minutes. Something was stirred in him, something not accounted for by the warm smell of the afternoon or the triumphant vividness of red. He felt persistently that the girl was beautiful. Then of a sudden he understood. It was her distance not a rare and precious distance of soul, but still distance, if only in terrestrial yards. The autumn air was between them, and the roofs and the blurred voices. Yet for a not altogether explained second, posing perversely in time, his emotion had been nearer to adoration than in the deepest kiss he had ever known. He finished his dressing, found a black bow-tie and adjusted it carefully by the three-sided mirror in the bathroom. Then, yielding to an impulse, he walked quickly into the bedroom and again looked out the window. The woman was standing up now. She had tossed her hair back and he had a full view of her. She was fat, full thirty-five, utterly undistinguished. Making a clicking noise with his mouth, he returned to the bathroom and reparted his hair. "'To you, beautiful lady,' he sang lightly, "'I raise my eyes.' Then, with a last soothing brush that left an iridescent surface of sheer gloss, he left his bathroom and his apartment and walked down Fifth Avenue to the Ritz-Carlton. Three Men at seven, Anthony and his friend Mari Noble are sitting at a corner table on the cool roof. Mari Noble is like nothing so much as a large, slender, and imposing cat. His eyes are narrow and full of incessant, protracted blinks. His hair is smooth and flat, as though it has been licked by a possible, and if so Herculean, mother cat. During Anthony's time at Harvard, he had been considered the most unique figure in his class the most brilliant, the most original, smart, quiet, and among the saved. This is the man whom Anthony considers his best friend. This is the only man of all his acquaintances whom he admires, and, to a bigger extent than he likes to admit to himself, envies. They're glad to see each other now, 
Their eyes are full of kindness as each feels the full effect of novelty after a short separation. They are drawing a relaxation from each other's presence, a new serenity. Mari Noble, behind that fine and absurdly cat-like face, is all but purring. And Anthony, nervous as a will-o'-the-wisp, restless, he is at rest now. They are engaged in one of those easy, short-speech conversations that only men under thirty or men under great stress indulge in. Anthony. Seven o'clock. Where's the caramel? Impatiently. I wish he'd finished that interminable novel. I've spent more time hungry. Mari. He's got a new name for it. The Demon Lover. Not bad, eh? Anthony, interested. The Demon Lover? Oh, woman wailing. No, not a bit bad. Not bad at all, do you think? Maury. Rather good. What time did you say? Anthony. Seven. Maury, his eyes narrowing, not unpleasantly, but to express a faint disapproval. Drove me crazy the other day. Anthony. How? Maury. That habit of taking notes. Anthony. Me too. Seems I'd said something night before that he considered material, but he'd forgotten it. So he had at me. He'd say, Can't you try to concentrate? And I'd say, You bore me to tears. How do I remember? Maury laughs noiselessly, by a sort of bland and appreciative widening of his features. Maury. Dick doesn't necessarily see more than anyone else. He merely can put down a larger proportion of what he sees. Anthony. That rather impressive talent. Maury. Oh, yes, impressive. Anthony. And energy, ambitious, well-directed energy. He's so entertaining. He's so tremendously stimulating and exciting. Often there's something breathless in being with him. Maury. Oh, yes. Silence, and then... Anthony with his thin, somewhat uncertain face at its most convinced. But not indomitable energy. Some day, bit by bit, it'll blow away, and his rather impressive talent with it, and leave only a wisp of a man, fretful and egotistic and garrulous. Maury, with laughter. Here we sit vowing to each other that little Dick sees less deeply into things than we do and I'll bet he feels a measure of superiority on his side. Creative mind over merely critical mind, and all that. Anthony. Oh, yes. But he's wrong. He's inclined to fall for a million silly enthusiasms. If it wasn't that he's absorbed in realism, and therefore has to adopt the garments of the cynic, he'd be... he'd be credulous as a college religious leader. He's an idealist. Oh, yes. He thinks he's not because he's rejected Christianity. Remember him in college? Just swallow every writer whole, one after another. Ideas, technique, and characters. Chesterton, Shaw, Wells, each one as easily as the last. Maury. Still considering his own last observation. I remember. Anthony. It's true. Natural-born fetish worshipper. Take art. Maury. Let's order. He'll be... Anthony. Sure, let's order. I told him. Maury. Here he comes. Look, he's going to bump that waiter. He lifts his finger as a signal, lifts it as though it were a soft and friendly claw. Here you are, Caramel. A new voice. Fiercely. Hello, Maury. Hello, Anthony Comstock Patch. How is old Adam's grandson? Debutante still after you, eh? In person, Richard Caramel is short and fair. He is to be bald at thirty-five. He has yellowish eyes, one of them startlingly clear, the other opaque as a muddy pool, and a bulging brow like a funny paper baby. He bulges in other places. His paunch bulges, prophetically, his words have an air of bulging from his mouth. Even his dinner-coat pockets bulge, as though from contamination with a dog-eared collection of timetables, programs, and miscellaneous scraps. On these he takes his notes with great screwings up of his unmatched yellow eyes and motions of silence with his disengaged left hand. 
When he reaches the table, he shakes hands with Anthony and Maury. He is one of those men who invariably shake hands, even with people whom they have seen an hour before. Anthony. Hello, Caramel. Glad you're here. We needed a comic relief. Maury. You're late. Been racing the postman down the block? We've been clawing over your character. Dick. Fixing Anthony eagerly with the bright eye. What did you say? Tell me and I'll write it down. Cut three thousand words out of part one this afternoon. Maury. Noble asthete. And I poured alcohol into my stomach. Dick. I don't doubt it. And I bet you two have been sitting here for an hour talking about liquor. Anthony. We never pass out, my beardless boy. Maury. We never go home with ladies we meet when we're lit. Anthony. All in our parties are characterized by a certain haughty distinction. Dick. The particularly silly sort who boast about being tanks. Trouble is, you're both in the eighteenth century. School of the old English squire. Drink quietly until you roll under the table. Never have a good time. Oh, no, that isn't done at all. Anthony. This is from chapter six, I'll bet. Dick. Going to the theater? Maury. Yes, we intend to spend the evening doing some deep thinking over of life's problems. The thing is tersely called the woman. I presume that she will pay. Anthony. My God, is that what it is? Let's go to the Follies again. Maury. I'm tired of it. I've seen it three times. To Dick. The first time we went out after Act One and found a most amazing bar. When we came back, we entered the wrong theater. Anthony. Had a protracted dispute with a scared young couple we thought were in our seats. Dick. As though talking to himself. I think that when I've done another novel and a play, and maybe a book of short stories, I'll do a musical comedy. Maury. I know, with intellectual lyrics that no one will listen to, and all the critics will groan and grunt about dear old Pinafore, and I shall go on shining as brilliantly meaningless figure in a meaningless world. Dick. Pompously. Art isn't meaningless. Maury. It is in itself. It isn't in that it tries to make life less so. Anthony. In other words, Dick, you're playing before a grandstand peopled with ghosts. Maury. Give a good show, anyhow. Anthony to Maury. On the contrary, I'd feel that it being a meaningless world, why write? The very attempt to give it purpose is purposeless. Dick. Well, even admitting all that, be a decent pragmatist and grant a poor man the instinct to live. Would you want everyone to accept that sophistic rot? Anthony. Yeah, I suppose so. Maury. No, sir. I believe that everyone in America but a selected thousand should be compelled to accept a very rigid system of morals. Roman Catholicism, for instance. I don't complain of conventional morality. I complain rather of the mediocre heretics who seize upon the findings of sophistication and adopt the pose of a moral freedom to which they are by no means entitled by their intelligences." Here the soup arrives, and what Maury might have gone on to say is lost for all time. Night Afterward they visited a ticket speculator and, at a price, obtained seats for a new musical comedy called Hijinks. In the foyer of the theatre they waited a few minutes to see the first night crowd come in. There were opera cloaks stitched of myriad, many-coloured silks and furs. There were jewels dripping from arms and throats and ear-tips of white and rose. There were innumerable broad shimmers down the middles of innumerable silk hats. There were shoes of gold and bronze and red and shining black. There were the high-piled, tight-packed coiffures of many women and the slick, watered hair of well-kept men. Most of all there was the ebbing, flowing, chattering, chuckling, foaming, slow-rolling wave effect of this cheerful sea of people as to-night it poured its glittering torrent into the artificial lake of laughter. After the play they parted, 
Mari was going to a dance at Sherry's, Anthony, homeward and to bed. He found his way slowly over the jostled evening mass of Times Square, which the chariot race and its thousand satellites made rarely beautiful and bright and intimate with carnival. Faces swirled about him, a kaleidoscope of girls, ugly, ugly as sin, too fat, too lean, yet floating upon this autumn air as upon their own warm and passionate breaths poured out into the night. Here, for all their vulgarity, he thought, they were faintly and subtly mysterious. He inhaled carefully, swallowing into his lungs perfume and the not unpleasant scent of many cigarettes. He caught the glance of a dark young beauty sitting alone in a closed taxicab. Her eyes in the half-light suggested night and violets, and for a moment he stirred again to that half-forgotten remoteness of the afternoon. Two young Jewish men passed him, talking in loud voices and craning their necks here and there in fatuous, supercilious glances. They were dressed in suits of the exaggerated tightness then semi-fashionable. Their turned-over collars were notched at the Adam's apple. They wore gray spats and carried gray gloves on their cane handles. Past a bewildered old lady borne along like a basket of eggs between two men, who exclaimed to her of the wonders of Times Square, explained them so quickly that the old lady, trying to be impartially interested, waved her head here and there like a piece of wind-worried old orange peel. Anthony heard a snatch of their conversation. There's the Astor, Mama. Look, see the chariot race sign. There's where we were today. No, there. Good gracious. You should worry and grow thin like a dime. He recognized the current witticism of the year as it issued stridently from one of the pairs at his elbow. And I says to him, I says. The soft rush of taxis by him, and laughter, laughter, hoarse as a crow's incessant and loud, with the rumble of the subways underneath, and over all the revolutions of light, the growings and recedings of light, light dividing like pearls, forming and reforming in glittering bars and circles and monstrous, grotesque figures cut amazingly on the sky. He turned thankfully down the hush that blew like a dark wind out of a cross-street, past a bakery restaurant in whose windows a dozen roast chickens turned over and over on an automatic spit. From the door came a smell that was hot, doughy, and pink. A drug store next, exhaling medicines, spilt soda water and a pleasant undertone from the cosmetic counter. Then a Chinese laundry, still open, steamy and stifling, smelling folded and vaguely yellow. All these depressed him. Reaching Sixth Avenue, he stopped at a corner cigar store and emerged feeling better. The cigar store was cheerful, humanity in a navy blue mist, buying a luxury. Once in his apartment, he smoked a last cigarette, sitting in the dark by his open front window. For the first time in over a year, he found himself thoroughly enjoying New York. There was a rare pungency in it, certainly, a quality almost southern. A lonesome town, though. He, who had grown up alone, had lately learned to avoid solitude. During the past several months he had been careful, when he had no engagement for the evening, to hurry to one of his clubs and find someone. Oh, there was a loneliness here. His cigarette, its smoke bordering the thin folds of curtain with rims of faint white spray, glowed on until the clock in St. Anne's down the street struck one with a querulous, fashionable beauty. The elevated, half a quiet block away, sounded a rumble of drums, and should he lean from his window he would see the train, like an angry eagle, breasting the dark curve at the corner. He was reminded of a fantastic romance he had lately read in which cities had been bombed from aerial trains and for a moment he fancied that Washington Square had declared war on Central Park, and that this was a northbound menace loaded with battle and sudden death. But as it passed the illusion faded. It diminished to the faintest of drums, then to a far-away droning eagle.
There were the bells and the continued low blur of auto horns from Fifth Avenue, but his own street was silent, and he was safe in here from all the threat of life, for there was his door and the long hall in his guardian bedroom. Safe, safe. The arc light shining into his window seemed for this hour like the moon, only brighter and more beautiful than the moon. A Flashback in Paradise Beauty, who was born anew every hundred years, sat in a sort of outdoor waiting-room through which blew gusts of white wind and occasionally a breathless hurried star. The stars winked at her intimately as they went by, and the winds made a soft, incessant flurry in her hair. She was incomprehensible, for in her soul and spirit were one, the beauty of her body was the essence of her soul. She was that unity sought for by philosophers through many centuries. In this outdoor waiting-room of winds and stars she had been sitting for a hundred years, at peace in the contemplation of herself. It became known to her at length that she was to be born again. Sighing, she began a long conversation with a voice that was in the white wind, a conversation that took many hours and of which I can give only a fragment here. Beauty, her lips scarcely stirring, her eyes turned as always inward upon herself. Whither shall I journey now? The voice. To a new country, a land you have never seen before. Beauty, petulantly. I loathe breaking into these new civilizations. How long a stay this time?" The voice. Fifteen years. Beauty. And what's the name of the place? The voice. It is the most opulent, most gorgeous land on earth, a land whose wisest are but little wiser than its dullest, a land where the rulers have minds like little children, and the lawgivers believe in Santa Claus where ugly women control strong men. Beauty, in astonishment. What? The voice, very much depressed. Yes, it is truly a melancholy spectacle. Women with receding chins and shapeless noses go about in broad daylight, saying, do this and do that, and all the men, even those of great wealth, obey implicitly their women to whom they refer sonorously either as Mrs. So-and-so or as the wife. Beauty. But this can't be true. I can understand, of course, their obedience to women of charm, but to fat women, to bony women, to women with scrawny cheeks? The voice. Even so. Beauty. What of me? What chance shall I have? The voice. It will be harder going, if I may borrow a phrase. Beauty. After a dissatisfied pause. Why not the old lands, the land of grapes and soft-tongued men, or the land of ships and seas? The voice. It's expected that they'll be very busy shortly. Beauty. Oh. The voice. Your life on earth will be, as always, the interval between two significant glances in a mundane mirror. Beauty. What will I be? Tell me. The voice. At first it was thought that you would go this time as an actress in the motion pictures, but, after all, it's not advisable. You will be disguised during your fifteen years as what is called a society girl. Beauty. What's that? There is a new sound in the wind, which must, for our purposes, be interpreted as the voice scratching its head. The voice, at length. It's a sort of bogus aristocrat. Beauty. Bogus? What is bogus? The voice. That, too, you will discover in this land. You will find much that is bogus. Also, you will do much that is bogus. Beauty, placidly. It all sounds so vulgar. The voice. Not half as vulgar as it is. You will be known during your fifteen years as a ragtime kid, a flapper, a jazz baby, and a baby vamp. 
you will dance new dances neither more nor less gracefully than you danced the old ones. Beauty, in a whisper, Will I be paid? The voice, Yes, as usual, in love. Beauty, with a faint laugh which disturbs only momentarily the immobility of her lips, And will I like being called a jazz baby? The voice, soberly, you will love it. The dialogue ends here, with beauty still sitting quietly, the stars pausing in an ecstasy of appreciation, the wind, white and gusty, blowing through her hair. All this took place seven years before Anthony sat by the front windows of his apartment and listened to the chimes of St. Anne's. End of chapter 1《Book One, Chapter Two, Part One of The Beautiful and Damned by F. Scott Fitzgerald. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Portrait of a Siren. Crispness folded down upon New York a month later, bringing November and the three big football games and a great fluttering of furs along Fifth Avenue. It brought also a sense of tension to the city and suppressed excitement. Every morning now there were invitations in Anthony's mail. Three dozen virtuous females of the first layer were proclaiming their fitness, if not their specific willingness, to bear children unto three dozen millionaires. Five dozen virtuous females of the second layer were proclaiming not only this fitness, but in addition a tremendous undaunted ambition toward the first three dozen young men who were, of course, invited to each of the ninety-six parties, as were the young ladies' group of family friends, acquaintances, college boys, and eager young outsiders. To continue, there was a third layer from the skirts of the city, from Newark and the Jersey suburbs up to bitter Connecticut and the ineligible sections of Long Island, and doubtless contiguous layers down to the city's shoes. Jewesses were coming out into a society of Jewish men and women, from Riverside to the Bronx, and looking forward to a rising young broker or jeweler and a kosher wedding. Irish girls were casting their eyes, with license at last to do so, upon a society of young Tammany politicians, pious undertakers, and grown-up choir-boys. And, naturally, the city caught the contagious air of entree. The working girls, poor ugly souls wrapping soap in the factories and showing finery in the big stores, dream that perhaps in the spectacular excitement of this winter they might obtain for themselves the coveted mail, as in a muddled carnival crowd an inefficient pickpocket may consider his chances increased. And the chimneys commenced to smoke and the subway's foulness was freshened and the actresses came out in new plays, and the publishers came out with new books, and the castles came out with new dances, and the railroads came out with new schedules containing new mistakes instead of the old ones that the commuters had grown used to. The city was coming out. Anthony, walking along 42nd Street one afternoon under a steel-gray sky, ran unexpectedly into Richard Caramel emerging from the Manhattan Hotel barber shop. It was a cold day, the first definitely cold day, and Caramel had on one of those knee-length, sheep-lined coats long worn by the working men of the Middle West, that were just coming into fashionable approval. His soft hat was of a discreet dark brown, and from under it his clear eye flamed like a topaz. He stopped Anthony enthusiastically, slapping him on the arms more from a desire to keep himself warm than from playfulness and, after his inevitable handshake, exploded into sound. "'Cold as the devil! Good Lord, I've been working like the deuce all day, till my room got so cold I thought I'd get pneumonia. Darn landlady economizing on coal came up when I yelled over the stairs for her for half an hour. Began explaining why and all. God, first she drove me crazy. Then I began to think she was sort of a character and took notes while she talked, so she couldn't see me, you know, just as though I were writing casually." 
He had seized Anthony's arm and was walking him briskly up Madison Avenue. "'Where to?' "'Nowhere in particular.' "'Well, then what's the use?' demanded Anthony. They stopped and stared at each other, and Anthony wondered if the cold made his own face as repellent as Dick Caramel's, whose nose was crimson, whose bulging brow was blue, whose yellow, unmatched eyes were red and watery at the rims. After a moment they began walking again. "'Done some good work on my novel!' Dick was looking and talking emphatically at the sidewalk. "'But I have to get out once in a while.' He glanced at Anthony apologetically, as though craving encouragement. "'I have to talk. I guess very few people ever really think, I mean sit down and ponder and have ideas in sequence. I do my thinking in writing or conversation. You've got to have a start, sort of, something to defend or contradict, don't you think?' Anthony grunted and withdrew his arm gently. "'I don't mind carrying you, Dick but with that coat. I mean," continued Richard Caramel gravely, that, on paper, your first paragraph contains the idea you're going to damn or enlarge on. In conversation you've got your vis-a-vis -vis last statement. But when you simply ponder, why, your ideas just succeed each other like magic lantern pictures, and each one forces out the last." They passed Forty-Fifth Street and slowed down slightly. Both of them lit cigarettes and blew tremendous clouds of smoke and frosted breath into the air. "'Let's walk up the plaza and have an eggnog,' suggested Anthony. "'Do you good. Air'll get the rotten nicotine out of your lungs. Come on, I'll let you talk about your book all the way.' "'I don't want to if it bores you. I mean, you needn't do it as a favor.' The words tumbled out in haste and though he tried to keep his face casual, it screwed up uncertainly. Anthony was compelled to protest. "'Bore me? I should say not.' "'Got a cousin,' began Dick, but Anthony interrupted by stretching out his arms and breathing forth a low cry of exultation. "'Good weather!' he exclaimed. "'Isn't it? Makes me feel about ten. I mean, it makes me feel as I should have felt when I was ten murderous. Oh, God, one minute it's my world, and the next I'm the world's fool. Today it's my world, and everything's easy, easy. Even nothing is easy. Got a cousin up at the plaza, famous girl. We can go up and meet her. She lives there in the winter, has lately anyway, with her mother and father. Didn't know you had cousins in New York. Her name's Gloria. She's from home, Kansas City. Her mother's a practicing billfist, and her father's quite dull but a perfect gentleman. What are they, literary material? They try to be. All the old man does is tell me he just met the most wonderful character for a novel. Then he tells me about some idiotic friend of his and then he says, There's a character for you. Why don't you write him up? Everybody be interested in him or else he tells me about Japan or Paris or some other very obvious place and says, why don't you write a story about that place? That'd be a wonderful setting for a story." "'How about the girl?' inquired Anthony casually. "'Gloria... Gloria what?' "'Gilbert. Oh, you've heard of her. Gloria Gilbert. Goes to dances at colleges, all that sort of thing.' "'I've heard her name. Good-looking. In fact, damned attractive." They reached Fiftieth Street and turned over toward the avenue. "'I don't care for young girls as a rule,' said Anthony, frowning. This was not strictly true. While it seemed to him that the average debutante spent every hour of her day thinking and talking about what the great world had mapped out for her to do during the next hour, any girl who made a living directly on her prettiness interested him enormously. Glorious darn nice. Not a brain in her head." Anthony laughed in a one-syllabled snort. "'By that you mean she hasn't a line of literary patter?' "'No, I don't.' "'Dick, you know what passes as brains in a girl for you. Earnest young women who sit with you in a corner and talk earnestly about life. 
the kind who, when they were sixteen, argued with grave faces as to whether kissing was right or wrong, and whether it was immoral for freshmen to drink beer. Richard Caramel was offended. His scowl crinkled like crushed paper. No, he began, but Anthony interrupted ruthlessly. Oh, yes, kind who just at present sit in corners and confer on the latest Scandinavian Dante available in English translation. Dick turned to him, a curious falling in his whole countenance. His question was almost an appeal. What's the matter with you and Maury? You talk sometimes as though I were a sort of inferior. Anthony was confused, but he was also cold and a little uncomfortable, so he took refuge in attack. I don't think your brains matter, Dick. Of course they matter, exclaimed Dick angrily. What do you mean? Why don't they matter? You might know too much for your pen. I couldn't possibly. I can imagine, insisted Anthony, a man knowing too much for his talent to express. Like me. Suppose, for instance, I have more wisdom than you and less talent. It would tend to make me inarticulate. You, on the contrary, have enough water to fill the pail and a big enough pail to hold the water. I don't follow you at all, complained Dick in a crestfallen tone. Infinitely dismayed, he seemed to bulge in protest. He was staring intently at Anthony and caroming off a succession of passers-by, who approached him with fierce, resentful glances. I simply mean that a talent like Wells's could carry the intelligence of a Spencer, but an inferior talent can only be graceful when it's carrying inferior ideas. And the more narrowly you can look at a thing, the more entertaining you can be about it." Dick considered, unable to decide the exact degree of criticism intended by Anthony's remarks. But Anthony, with that facility which seemed so frequently to flow from him, continued his dark eyes gleaming in his thin face, his chin raised, his voice raised, his whole physical being raised. Say I am proud and sane and wise, an Athenian among Greeks. Well, I might fail where a lesser man would succeed. He could imitate, he could adorn, he could be enthusiastic, he could be hopefully constructive. But this hypothetical me would be too proud to imitate, too sane to be enthusiastic, too sophisticated to be utopian, too Grecian to adorn. Then you don't think the artist works from his intelligence? No. He goes on improving, if he can, what he imitates in the way of style, and choosing from all his own interpretation of the things around him what constitutes material. But, after all, every writer writes because it's his mode of living. Don't tell me you like this divine function of the artist business. I'm not accustomed even to refer to myself as an artist. Dick, said Anthony, changing his tone, I want to beg your pardon. Why? For that outburst? I'm honestly sorry. I was talking for effect. Somewhat mollified, Dick rejoined, I have often said you were a Philistine at heart. It was a crackling dusk when they turned in under the white façade of the plaza and tasted slowly the foam and yellow thickness of an eggnog. Anthony looked at his companion. Richard Caramel's nose and brow were slowly approaching a like pigmentation. The red was leaving the one, the blue deserting the other. Glancing in a mirror, Anthony was glad to find that his own skin had not discolored. On the contrary, a faint glow had kindled in his cheeks, he fancied that he had never looked so well. "'Enough for me,' said Dick, his tone that of an athlete in training. "'I want to go up and see the Gilberts. Won't you come?' "'Why, yes, if you don't dedicate me to the parents and dash off in the corner with Dora.' "'Not Dora, Gloria.' A clerk announced them over the phone and, ascending to the tenth floor, they followed a winding corridor and knocked at 1088. The door was answered by a middle-aged lady, Mrs. Gilbert herself. "'How do you do?' she spoke in the conventional American lady-lady language. "'Well, I'm awfully glad to see you.' 
hasty interjections by Dick, and then, "'Mr. Patts, well, do come in and leave your coat there.' She pointed to a chair and changed her inflection to a deprecatory laugh full of minute gasps. "'This is really lovely, lovely. Why, Richard, you haven't been here for so long. No, no!' The latter monosyllable served half as responses, half as periods, to some vague starts from Dick. "'Well, do sit down and tell me what you've been doing.' One crossed and recrossed, one stood and bowed ever so gently, one smiled again and again with helpless stupidity. One wondered if she would ever sit down, at length one slid thankfully into a chair and settled for a pleasant call. I suppose it's because you've been busy, as much as anything else," smiled Mrs. Gilbert, somewhat ambiguously. The as much as anything else she used to balance all her more rickety sentences. She had two other ones. At least that's the way I look at it, and pure and simple. These three, alternated, gave each of her remarks an air of being a general reflection on life as though she had calculated all causes and at length put her finger on the ultimate one. Richard Caramel's face, Anthony saw, was now quite normal. The brow and cheeks were of a flesh color, and the nose politely inconspicuous. He had fixed his aunt with a bright yellow eye, giving her that acute and exaggerated attention that young males are accustomed to render to all females who are of no further value. Are you a writer, too, Mr. Patts? Well, perhaps we can all bask in Richard's fame." Gentle laughter led by Mrs. Gilbert. "'Glory is out,' she said, with an air of laying down an axiom from which she would proceed to derive results. "'She's dancing somewhere. Gloria goes, goes, goes. I tell her I don't see how she stands it. She dances all afternoon and all night until I think she's going to wear herself to a shadow. Her father is very worried about her." She smiled from one to the other. They both smiled. She was composed, Anthony perceived, of a succession of semicircles and parabolas, like those figures that gifted folk make on the typewriter. Head, arms, bust, hips, thighs, and ankles were in a bewildering tier of roundnesses. Well ordered and clean she was, with hair of an artificially rich gray, her large face sheltered weather-beaten blue eyes and was adorned with just the faintest white mustache. "'I always say,' she remarked to Anthony, "'that Richard is an ancient soul.' In the tense pause that followed, Anthony considered a pun, something about Dick having been much walked upon. We all have souls of different ages," continued Mrs. Gilbert radiantly. At least that's what I say. Perhaps so, agreed Anthony, with an air of quickening to a hopeful idea. The voice bubbled on. Gloria has a very young soul, irresponsible as much as anything else. She has no sense of responsibility. She's sparkling, Aunt Catherine," said Richard pleasantly. A sense of responsibility would spoil her. She's too pretty." "'Well,' confessed Mrs. Gilbert, "'all I know is that she goes and goes and goes.'" The number of goings to Gloria's discredit was lost in the rattle of the doorknob as it turned to admit Mr. Gilbert. He was a short man with a mustache resting like a small white cloud beneath his undistinguished nose. He had reached the stage where his value as a social creature was a black and imponderable negative. His ideas were the popular delusions of twenty years before. His mind steered a wobbly and anemic course in the wake of the daily newspaper editorials. After graduating from a small but terrifying Western university, he had entered the celluloid business, and as this required only the minute measure of intelligence he brought to it, he did well for several years, in fact until about 1911, when he began exchanging contracts for vague agreements with the moving picture industry. The moving picture industry had decided about 1912 to gobble him up, and at this time he was, so to speak, 
delicately balanced on his tongue. Meanwhile, he was supervising manager of the Associated Midwestern Film Materials Company, spending six months of each year in New York and the remainder in Kansas City and St. Louis. He felt credulously that there was a good thing coming to him, and his wife thought so, and his daughter thought so too. He disapproved of Gloria. She stayed out late, she never ate her meals, she was always in a mix-up. He had irritated her once, and she had used toward him words that he had not thought were part of her vocabulary. His wife was easier. After fifteen years of incessant guerrilla warfare, he had conquered her. It was a war of muddled optimism against organized dullness, and something in the number of yeses with which he could poison a conversation had won him the victory. "'Yes, yes, yes, yes,' he would say. "'Yes, yes, yes, yes. Let me see. That was the summer of—let me see. Ninety-one or ninety-two. Yes, 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 yes.' Fifteen years of yeses had beaten Mrs. Gilbert. Fifteen further years of that incessant unaffirmative affirmative, accompanied by the perpetual flicking of ash mushrooms from thirty-two thousand cigars, had broken her. To this husband of hers she had made the last concession of married life, which is more complete, more irrevocable, than the first. She listened to him. She told herself that the years had brought her tolerance, actually they had slain what measure she had ever possessed of moral courage. She introduced him to Anthony. "'This is Mr. Patts,' she said. The young man and the old touched flesh. Mr. Gilbert's hand was soft, worn away to the pulpy semblance of a squeezed grapefruit. Then husband and wife exchanged greetings. He told her it had grown colder out. He said he had walked down to a newsstand on 44th Street for a Kansas City paper. He had intended to ride back in the bus, but he had found it too cold. Yes, 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 too cold. Mrs. Gilbert added flavor to his adventure by being impressed with his courage in braving the harsh air. "'Well, you are spunky!' she exclaimed admiringly. "'You are spunky! I wouldn't have gone out for anything!' Mr. Gilbert with true masculine impassivity disregarded the awe he had excited in his wife. He turned to the two young men and triumphantly routed them on the subject of the weather. Richard Caramel was called on to remember the month of November in Kansas. No sooner had the theme been pushed toward him, however, than it was violently fished back to be lingered over, pawed over, elongated, and generally devitalized by its sponsor. The immemorial thesis that the days somewhere were warm but the nights very pleasant was successfully propounded and they decided the exact distance on an obscure railroad between two points that Dick had inadvertently mentioned. Anthony fixed Mr. Gilbert with a steady stare and went into a trance through which, after a moment, Mrs. Gilbert's smiling voice penetrated. "'It seems as though the cold were damper here. It seems to eat into my bones.' As this remark, adequately yes, had been on the tip of Mr. Gilbert's tongue, he could not be blamed for rather abruptly changing the subject. "'Where's Gloria? She ought to be here any minute. Have you met my daughter, Mr.—' "'Haven't had the pleasure. I've heard Dick speak of her often. She and Richard are cousins.' "'Yes?' Anthony smiled with some effort. He was not used to the society of his seniors, and his mouth was stiff from superfluous cheerfulness. It was such a pleasant thought about Gloria and Dick being cousins. He managed within the next minute to throw an agonized glance at his friend. Richard Caramel was afraid they'd have to toddle off. Mrs. Gilbert was tremendously sorry. Mr. Gilbert thought it was too bad. Mrs. Gilbert had a further idea. Something about being glad they'd come anyhow, even if they'd only seen an old lady way too old to flirt with them. Anthony and Dick evidently considered this a sly sally, for they laughed one bar in three-four time. Would they come again soon? Oh, yes. Glory will be awfully sorry. Good-bye, good-bye, smiles, smiles, bang. 
two disconsolate young men walking down the tenth-floor corridor of the plaza in the direction of the elevator. A LADY'S LEGS Behind Maury Noble's attractive indolence, his irrelevance and his easy mockery, lay a surprising and relentless maturity of purpose. His intention, as he stated it in college, had been to use three years in travel, three years in utter leisure, and then to become immensely rich as quickly as possible. His three years of travel were over. He had accomplished the globe with an intensity and curiosity that in any one else would have seemed pedantic, without redeeming spontaneity, almost the self-editing of a human Baedeker. But in this case it assumed an air of mysterious purpose and significant design, as though Maury Noble were some predestined antichrist, urged by a preordination to go everywhere there was to go along the earth and to see all the billions of humans who bred and wept and slew each other here and there upon it. Back in America he was sallying into the search for amusement with the same consistent absorption. He, who had never taken more than a few cocktails or a pint of wine at a sitting, taught himself to drink as he would have taught himself Greek. Like Greek, it would be the gateway to a wealth of new sensations, new psychic states, new reactions in joy or misery. His habits were a matter for esoteric speculation. He had three rooms in a bachelor apartment on 44th Street, but he was seldom to be found there. The telephone girl had received the most positive instructions that no one should even have his ear without first giving a name to be passed upon. She had a list of half a dozen people to whom he was never at home, and of the same number to whom he was always at home. Foremost on the latter lists were Anthony Patch and Richard Caramel. Maury's mother lived with her married son in Philadelphia, and there Maury went usually for the weekends. So one Saturday night, when Anthony, prowling the chilly streets in a fit of utter boredom, dropped in at the Molten Arms, he was overjoyed to find that Mr. Noble was at home. His spirit soared faster than the flying elevator. This was so good, so extremely good, to be about to talk to Maury, who would be equally happy at seeing him. They would look at each other with a deep affection just behind their eyes, which both would conceal beneath some attenuated raillery. Had it been summer, they would have gone out together and indolently sipped two long Tom Collinses, as they wilted their collars and watched the faintly diverting round of some lazy August cabaret. But it was cold outside, with wind around the edges of the tall buildings and December just up the street, so better far an evening together under the soft lamplight and a drink or two of Bushmills, or a thimbleful of Maury's Grand Marnier, with the books gleaming like ornaments against the walls, and Maury radiating a divine inertia as he rested, large and cat-like, in his favorite chair. There he was. The room closed about Anthony, warmed him. The glow of that strong persuasive mind, that temperament almost oriental in its outward impassivity, warmed Anthony's restless soul and brought him a peace that could be likened only to the peace a stupid woman gives. One must understand all, else one must take all for granted. Maury filled the room, tiger-like, god-like. The winds outside were stilled, the brass candlesticks on the mantel glowed like tapers before an altar. "'What keeps you here today? Anthony spread himself over a yielding sofa and made an elbow rest among the pillows. "'Just been here an hour. Tea dance. And I stayed so late I missed my train to Philadelphia.' "'Strange to stay so long,' commented Anthony curiously. "'Rather. What did you do?' "'Geraldine. Little usher at Keith's. I told you about her.' "'Oh! Paid me a call about three and stayed till five peculiar little soul. She gets me. She's so utterly stupid." Maury was silent. "'Strange as it may seem,' continued Anthony, "'so far as I'm concerned, and even so far as I know, Geraldine is a paragon of virtue.' He had known her a month, a girl of nondescript and nomadic habits. 
someone had casually passed her on to Anthony, who considered her amusing and rather liked the chaste and fairy-like kisses she had given him on the third night of their acquaintance, when they had driven in a taxi through the park. She had a vague family, a shadowy aunt and uncle who shared with her an apartment in the labyrinthine hundreds. She was company, familiar and faintly intimate and restful. Further than that, he did not care to experiment, not from any moral compunction, but from a dread of allowing any entanglement to disturb what he felt was the growing serenity of his life. She has two stunts, he informed Maury. One of them is to get her hair over her eyes some way and then blow it out, and the other is to say, you crazy, when someone makes a remark that's over her head. It fascinates me. I sit there hour after hour, completely intrigued by the maniacal symptoms she finds in my imagination." Mari stirred in his chair and spoke. "'Remarkable that a person can comprehend so little and yet live in such a complex civilization. A woman like that actually takes the whole universe in the most matter-of-fact way. From the influence of Rousseau to the bearing of the tariff rates on her dinner, the whole phenomenon is utterly strange to her. She's just been carried along from an age of spearheads and plunked down here with the equipment of an archer for going into a pistol duel. You could sweep away the entire crust of history and she'd never know the difference. I wish our Richard would write about her. Anthony, surely you don't think she's worth writing about? As much as anybody, he answered, yawning. You know, I was thinking today that I have a great confidence in Dick. So long as he sticks to people and not to ideas, and as long as his inspirations come from life and not from art, and always granting a normal growth, I believe he'll be a big man. I should think the appearance of the black notebook would prove that he's going to life." Anthony raised himself on his elbow and answered eagerly, "'He tries to go to life. So does every author except the very worst. But, after all, most of them live on predigested food. The incident or character may be from life, but the writer usually interprets it in terms of the last book he read. For instance, suppose he meets a sea captain and thinks he's an original character. The truth is that he sees the resemblance between the sea captain and the last sea captain Dana created, or whoever creates sea captains and therefore he knows how to set this sea captain on paper. Dick, of course, can set down any consciously picturesque, character-like character, but could he accurately transcribe his own sister? Then they were off for half an hour on literature. A classic, suggested Anthony, is a successful book that has survived the reaction of the next period or generation. Then it's safe like a style in architecture or furniture. It's acquired a picturesque dignity to take the place of its fashion." After a time the subject temporarily lost its tang. The interest of the two young men was not particularly technical. They were in love with the generalities. Anthony had recently discovered Samuel Butler, and the brisk aphorisms in the notebook seemed to him the quintessence of criticism. Maury, his whole mind so thoroughly mellowed by the very hardness of his scheme of life, seemed inevitably the wiser of the two. Yet in the actual stuff of their intelligences they were not, it seemed, fundamentally different. They drifted from letters to the curiosities of each other's day. Whose tea was it? People named Abercrombie. Why'd you stay late? Meet a luscious debutante? Yes. Did you really? Anthony's voice lifted in surprise. Not a debutante exactly. Said she came out two winters ago in Kansas City. Sort of leftover? No, answered Maury, with some amusement. I think that's the last thing I'd say about her. She seemed, well, somehow the youngest person there. Not too young to make you miss a train. Young enough. Beautiful child. Anthony chuckled his one-syllable snort. Oh, Maury, you're in your second childhood. 
What do you mean by beautiful? Maury gazed helplessly into space. Well, I can't describe her exactly, except to say that she was beautiful. She was tremendously alive. She was eating gumdrops. What? It was a sort of attenuated vice. She's a nervous kind, said she always ate gumdrops at teas because she had to stand around so long in one place. What did you talk about? Bergson? Bilphism? Whether the one step is immoral? Maury was unruffled. His fur seemed to run all ways. As a matter of fact, we did talk on Bilphism. Seems her mother's a Bilphist. Mostly, though, we talked about legs. Anthony rocked in glee. My God, whose legs? Hers. She talked a lot about hers, as though they were a sort of choice bric-a-brac. She aroused a great desire to see them. What is she, a dancer? No, I found she was a cousin of Dick's. Anthony sat upright so suddenly that the pillow he released stood on end like a living thing and dove to the floor. "'Name's Gloria Gilbert?' he cried. "'Yes. Isn't she remarkable?' "'I'm sure I don't know. But for sheer dullness, her father—' "'Well,' interrupted Maury with implacable conviction, "'her family may be as sad as professional mourners, but I'm inclined to think that she's a quite authentic and original character. The outer signs of the cut-and-dried Yale prom girl and all that. But different, very emphatically different." "'Go on, go on,' urged Anthony. Soon as Dick told me she didn't have a brain in her head, I knew she must be pretty good. Did he say that? Swore to it," said Anthony, with another snorting laugh. Well, what he means by brains in a woman is— I know, interrupted Anthony eagerly, he means a smattering of literary misinformation. That's it. The kind who believes that the annual moral letdown of the country is a very good thing, or the kind who believes it's a very ominous thing. Either pince nay or postures. Well, this girl talked about legs. She talked about skin, too. Her own skin always her own. She told me the sort of tan she'd like to get in the summer, and how closely she usually approximates it. You sat enraptured by her low alto? By her low alto? No, by tan. I began thinking about tan. I began to think what color I turned when I made my last exposure about two years ago. I did used to get a pretty good tan. I used to get sort of bronze, if I remember rightly." Anthony retired into the cushions, shaken with laughter. "'She's got you going! Oh, Maury! Maury the Connecticut lifesaver! The human nutmeg! Extra! Eris elopes with Coast Guard because of his luscious pigmentation! Afterward found to be Tasmanian strain in his family!' Maury sighed, rising, he walked to the window and raised the shade. "'Snowing hard!' Anthony, still laughing quietly to himself, made no answer. "'Another winter!' Maury's voice from the window was almost a whisper. "'We're growing old, Anthony. I'm twenty-seven, by God. Three years to thirty, and then I'm what an undergraduate calls a middle-aged man.' Anthony was silent for a moment. "'You are old, Maury,' he agreed at length. "'The first signs of a very dissolute and wobbly senescence. You have spent the afternoon talking about tan and a lady's legs.' Maury pulled down the shade with a sudden harsh snap. "'Idiot!' he cried. "'That from you? Here I sit, young Anthony as I'll sit for a generation or more and watch such gay souls as you and Dick and Gloria Gilbert go past me, dancing and singing and loving and hating one another and being moved, being eternally moved. And I am moved only by my lack of emotion. I shall sit and the snow will come, oh, for a caramel to take notes, and another winter and I shall be thirty and you and Dick and Gloria will go on being eternally moved and dancing by me and singing. 
but after you've all gone, I'll be saying things for new dicks to write down, and listening to the disillusions and cynicisms and emotions of new Anthonys, yes, and talking to new Glorias about the tans of summers yet to come." The firelight flurried up on the hearth. Maury left the window, stirred the blaze with a poker, and dropped a log upon the andirons. Then he sat back in his chair, and the remains of his voice faded in the new fire that spit red and yellow along the bark. After all, Anthony, it's you who are very romantic and young. It's you who are infinitely more susceptible and afraid of your calm being broken. It's me who tries again and again to be moved, let myself go a thousand times, and I'm always me. Nothing quite stirs me. Yet, he murmured after another long pause, there was something about that little girl with her absurd tan that was eternally old, like me. End of Book One, Chapter Two, Part One